studies. Um, I taught 30 years, believe it or not, at, at Lock Haven, and I enjoyed every single one of them. And they said I could do any lecture I wanted, and I decided to do the one on my favorite part of being an anthropologist, which is doing participant observation. And I wanted to do this not only because it's my favorite lecture and because it's my favorite activity in being an anthropologist, but because it's the thing that makes anthropology unique. We gather our data differently from any other field. And participant observation is exactly what it sounds like. We go somewhere, we live there for a long period of time. Um, first place I'm going to talk about is Egypt. I was there for a year and a half. Uh, we, you know, I live with a family, you, you participate in everything you can possibly participate in, you observe those few things that you can't participate in, and essentially you learn the culture from the inside. And that's important because otherwise you have absolutely no idea if what people say they do are what they're really doing, unless you're there actually observing what they're doing. All other sciences kind of breeze in and you know they you know talk to somebody on the phone or they stand in the front door and you know do a, a quick and dirty little interview or god forbid they just you know contact you ver you know versus email or something like that and you have absolutely no idea if what people say they're doing is actually true or not so we think it's very very important to do participant observation to be with the community for a long period of time and to really understand from the inside what's going on in the community. So um, I'm going to be talking to you about um, two places in the world, Egypt and Mexico, where I did my participant observation. I was extremely lucky. I was able to live with families in all three of the villages that I studied. And that's the best way, because you're learning 24-7 then. I mean, I can remember, you know, when I was so tired, I mean, learning Arabic is really a bitch. <laughs> and I can remember just, I mean, my, I had actually, my head would ache, and I would be like, I can't, I don't want one more word to go in there. I Just let me go to sleep. No, 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 we've got more to tell you, more to tell you. I mean, you learn all the time. So this is the village that I lived in in Egypt, and it was a very small village, 6,000 people by Egyptian standards and was considered to be kind of way out in the way because Egypt is a big country, but everybody lives right along the Nile. So this was considered really out in the countryside. And all this low stuff down here is mostly alfalfa, which was used for animal feed. And the trees that you see here are mostly citrus and palm trees, which were grown for um, mostly uh, wholesale and dates. And you can, this is the, an unfinished uh, temple pyramid, actually that was never, uh, ex has been, hasn't been excavated. And you can see how the houses are very close together. People don't have front yards and backyards, and you don't have a side yard. The houses are built right, right close together, right on the street. And you can see how people were starting to build up because um, their, you know, their kids are getting married, and so they'll build you know, apartments on, on the, uh, the upper floors. And then so the way, you know, we have like a farmhouse surrounded by a farm. That's, you don't find that in most places in the world. This is what you find almost everywhere. You have a, a village where everybody's like living right on top of one another, surrounded by their farmland, and then the next village, you know, will be way over here. This village was in Giza. So um, I used to pass the Great Pyramid of Giza on my way to Cairo, and we were about an hour outside of Cairo. So. Um, this is the woman whose house I was living in. Her name is Haja Fatea. Uh, her, she was, when she was born, her name was Fatea, and when she uh, went, uh, when she had her first son, her name became Om Muhammad, meaning um, mother of Muhammad. And then when she went on the pilgrimage to Mecca, she became a Haja, which is a, uh, an honorific title. And um, here you can see, this is kind of the typical kind of clothing that women in the village wear, so I had to have a whole brand new outfit. And so she made me a whole brand new outfit. And this was, according to my age and marital status, this was the kind of galabia that I should have been wearing. But this dress that you see here, it's called a 
for, huh? And as you can see, it's this long, long piece of taffeta. And you tie it in a complicated kind of way, and it goes all the way down here. And I couldn't keep this sucker on my head safe my life. <laughs> I walked around like this, the damn thing just fell right off. <laughs> so I stopped wearing that kind of style of galabia, and I started to wear this style of galabia, which is kind of a, a simpler, younger kind of style. And so when I was in the house, I would wear a colored headscarf over my hair, like you see up there. And then to, when I left the house to show that I was a married woman, I put this black headscarf uh, over top of it, so it'd be like this. And uh, so that was my style of galabia. And then my husband was there for the last year. Uh, I was there for six months by myself, and then he came for the last year. And uh, this was his galabia. Yeah, this is the kind of style of galabia that older men were. And of course, I had to learn Arabic. And uh, Hajja Fateo uh, was an amazing woman. She became kind of my, uh, you know, favorite person in the world. And even when my Arabic was not that great, she always understood me, which was very handy. <laughs> and this is her husband, Hag Abdul Jawad. And here he is with his um, youngest son and one of his grandchildren. And he was very important in my research because he was a hag. He'd been on the pilgrimage to Mecca. He was a shaman. Uh, he knew how to cure people. He uh, <coughs> was um, a member of the largest and oldest patrilineage, so he was very well respected. He had 10 children, so he was an elder. And because I was living in his household, and you know he was kind of vouching for me, you know I never had any trouble with anybody. So he was uh, very important to me. So this is me back in the 80s, and this was when I was trying to rock the Torah, huh? and it didn't work out too well. <laughs> so this was more of the look that I had there. And this was my uh, dissertation research, uh, and, and I was there, you know, just before I started teaching when I was still in graduate school. This was our living room, and basically this was the furniture. We had a table with a TV on it, but that was pretty much it. So, um, you know, we, we sat cross-legged on the floor like that. Now, they say that Egypt is the gift of the Nile, and what that means is, is that if you don't irrigate something, it doesn't grow. And so when I was there for a year and a half straight, it rained twice. Once for two hours, once for three hours. That's it. It doesn't rain. It's the Sahara Desert, folks. <laughs> you know? So every tree, every blade of glass, grass has to be irrigated. So one of the ways that you do this is through uh, a water wheel, a very ancient way of irrigating. Basically, you've got um, a donkey going around and around and around, and the wheel is transferring that to lift the, a bucket of water you know, at a time. And it's a two-person operation. A little kid to make sure the donkey keeps going around, and then a man to open and close the, the earth and irrigation ditches. And this is another way of irrigating. This is uh, Abjawad in our garden. Uh, just kind of a counterbalanced uh, wheel, uh, uh, well. But if you can afford it, you could buy one of these things. And it's expensive. It's about the equivalent of a factory worker salary for a month. But now you can irrigate without having it be a two-person operation. And it's a lot faster. So if you have access to a tractor and you have access to one of these things, this means you can be a part-time farmer. And most of the, the farmers in the village were actually part-time farmers. They had jobs in factories. We had a plastics factory, an auto factory. Um, and like Abdullah, he, he worked at the, the local sewage treatment plant. And then they, you know, they farmed part-time. And so they were farming, they weren't subsistence farmers. They were um, cash crop farmers. Um, now this is uh, Abdullah, one of the sons of the household. And right, one of the first things that happened right after uh, I got there is that he got married. And so this is the woman that he married to. And 
And uh, the, she's all dressed up in her visiting gown. This is the first time she's gone home to see her, her parents. These people are patrilocal. That means that when a son gets married, he brings his wife into the household. And the wife and the children stay in that household with his parents until he's old enough to have children of his own. And then they move out and start their own household. And this is our house. And downstairs is kind of the old family homestead. And up here they built two apartment buildings. And uh, Abdullah and his new bride were living up here. And <coughs> then what happened was I lived downstairs with the family for the first six months I was there. And then my husband joined me for the last year. And we moved into the second apartment over here. So this was absolutely ideal because I was still part of the family. You know, they were still there to help me with anything I needed. Um, but, you know, my husband and I had some privacy, and most importantly, I had my own kitchen so that I could cook, because there's a reason why you've never heard of an Egyptian restaurant. Their food's not that great. So, um, you know, at least I didn't like it all that much. It's very heavily garlicky and spicy, and so uh, I was, it was nice for me to be able to cook on my own. So this is my kitchen. I was one of the first people in the village to get one of these gas stoves. Everybody was all excited about it. And my husband, you know, went to great lengths to, um, to make these shelves for me because wood is very, very, very expensive here because, of course, it all has to be irrigated. And uh, most women in the village actually used one of these little kerosene stoves. Can you imagine having toddlers around cooking with this on the ground? Oh, it's not fun. Uh, so you can see here that uh, you know people who live in big extended families, so they they cook big meals. So they have you know two big meals a day, and then they have kind of leftovers for breakfast. And you can see that they would be doing most of their cooking down on the floor. They did almost everything down on the floor. And so the Egyptians can can squat like this comfortably for hours. I can do it for maybe five seconds. <laughs> which is the reason why I had the shelves built for me and stuff. So when you go home, next time you're home, try going home and squatting down like that and, and peeling and chopping up vegetables, and you'll see the problem that I had. This was my dining room, and so, um, I, you know, I, had, I didn't want to sit cross-legged on the floor anymore, so, you know, I had a nice table, and I had my refrigerator. It was the bathroom was back there, and then I had like a, a den, and this is my <coughs> living room, and this is my husband, and so we had a really, really, and then we had a bedroom, so we had a really, really nice uh, apartment. And this was a very typical kind of day. I get up in the morning, I have breakfast, I go out to my first family. Um, people got nervous if I wrote anything down, so I'd ask all my questions and do all my observations, and I'd come home, and I would, um, you know, write that down and have lunch and then I go out and do it again in the afternoon and uh, be exhausted by 8 p.m. <laughs> Sometimes I should be in bed by 8 p.m. because, like I said, until six months in I got fluent in Arabic, but after that time my Arabic was kind of a, a chore. When I first started learning it, I could, I could, you know, people could understand me okay and, and if I was talking to somebody and kind of concentrating on them, um, I could understand them. And then I don't know how many of you you know, actually have gotten into languages in a big kind of way. But around, I don't know, I think it was around four months in, I guess, because I was fluent by the time Terry showed up. I was, um, I was on a bus, I was on a taxi going into Cairo, and I felt something click in my brain. And all of a sudden, I could understand all the conversations going on around me. And then I started dreaming in Arabic, thinking in <laughs> Arabic, so, you know, it takes a while for it kind of to sink in. So this is me, and I'm surrounded by all of the uh, women and children, because I was there to study the status of women, so that's why I was working during the day when the men weren't there. And uh, we're laughing and we're joking, and they're asking me questions, and they were very curious about every aspect of my life. So if they could ask me startling personal questions, I figured, well, I could ask them startlingly personal questions as well. And uh, so I had a lot of fun. Egyptians love to laugh. So that was good. This was another family that I worked in. Here's me. And this was actually a really unusual family because 
they were actually subsistence farmers. So we're in their cornfield, and they're actually going to grind up that corn and make it into cornbread and eat it. So uh, the head of the household is right here, and this was her two sons and their wives and children. So these people are um, Muslims. Muslim men are allowed to have more than one wife, but it's not very common. And this was one of the very few men in the village that had more, one, more than one wife. What was going on here, this was his first wife, and she never was able to have children. So in order to have children, he married his second wife. Unfortunately, she didn't have any children either. Now in those days, there weren't any doctors that you could go to, so you know, it was obviously, you know, not obviously, but it was probably his fault that there weren't any children. So they got along very well. She ran a local store, and she did all the housework. And um, this was kind of my right outside of my family. This was kind of you know the first people I got to know pretty well. This is an, uh, an engagement party. This is a very, very, very important time in a woman's life. Uh, gold is a woman's bank account. These women don't have bank accounts, so they get gifts of gold. Starting from when they're little girls, they get gold earrings, and uh, they get gifts of gold. And here she's getting her, her gold wedding bangles. And that's her property. So if she wants, if she needs money, there's a gold seller that goes around every day. And she can, you know, get, you know, sell some of her gold. And I've known women who've been able to actually buy property and build houses based on this gold jewelry that they save up. Now, um, one of the, one of, I was there to study the effect of education and employment on the status of women. And of course, women everywhere have to do housework. And one of the main problems that women had here is getting water. Now. Um, Egypt was a colony of Great Britain, and they did not get their independence until 1952. So in 1952, which is the year I was born, that country had nothing. It had no road system. It had no electrical system. It had, outside of Cairo, there was nothing. There was no schools. There was no roads. There was no water. There was just nothing. Because if you're a colony, they don't want you to regress. So they had to do everything from scratch. So this village, which is relatively close to Cairo, was able to finally get water in the 1970s. So what would happen is, is that they had these public taps of water. And then women would go with these big um, you know, containers of water on their head to go get enough water for their family. Um, water is very, very, very heavy. And it's just, it was amazing to me, these women could have this full tank of water in their head and just, you know, have a baby on their hip and a big full shopping basket and just, just walk down the street, not even, you know, balancing it or anything. Little girls of six could carry heavier loads on their heads than I could. It takes all that time to build up those muscles so that you can carry that heavy, heavy load. We were lucky. We paid, we had a newer house and we paid a little bit extra for them to pipe water into our house. So we, we would hand prime this pump and we put an electric pump on it, pump the water up into on the roof, and then it would gravity feed down into um, the taps, into a sh you know, shower and, and sinks. So we were lucky we had running water. And then when I was there in the 90s, um, we actually had a water heater so we could have hot showers. The other important thing for women to do is to bake bread. The word for life in Arabic is ish. The word for bread in, in Egyptian Arabic is ish. So bread is life. And most of your calories come from this bread. And it takes all day long for the women to make it, you know, starting you know, with mixing the flour and the yeast and everything in the morning. You let these, uh, uh, these loaves kind of raise a little bit in the sun. And then you see this like little pizza paddle kind of thing. This was one of those things I had to just observe because I, we would have starved if we would <laughs> it relied upon me. But she'd put that dough in there and go, <laughs> and it would be perfectly, you know, round. And then she gives it to Fatma here. And this is a little beehive oven. There's a fire down here and there's a shelf here. And Fatma would go, ta-da, and this bread would magically go in there, you know, perfectly straight instead of in a clumpy ball like when I would do it. And it only took about a minute to cook. And then these are the finished loaves down here. And a man would eat two of these loaves uh, a day in a meal. And this is our dining room table. 
when we weren't using it, we just put it on the side. And then when we were ready to eat, we kind of wheel it out and people would sit cross-legged around the table. And oftentimes you would use the bread as, as a, you know, like a little scoop to scoop up the, the soup or the vegetables or whatever you were eating. And it's really good bread. If you've ever had brick oven bread, that's what it tastes like. Or if you've ever been to like a really classy um, Greek restaurant that does, you know, on site, does the pita bread. Oh, it's so good. Another really important thing for women to do is to take care of the animals. These are little baby geese. We had uh, chickens, geese, rabbits, doves, um, and goats in our house. And the, the reason why a, a frugal housewife raises animals is because anything that had anything to do with these protein foods was really expensive. So uh, a frugal housewife raises her own meat, uh, and chickens and things like that, and then you know she can sell the excess. So these are little baby geese. And some people still actually had the water buffaloes. The water buffaloes were the traditional animal that used to plow, but if you had a good producing water buffalo, um, you know, you could sell the milk and the cheese and pretty much support a family on that. Uh, so they were very, very valuable animals, but not very many people had them anymore because most people were using tractors. But again, that was the work of the, of the women to, you know, muck out the stalls and, and do the milking and stuff like that. So that was the housework that women did. Um, but I was also in, you know, wanted to know whether or not if women worked and brought in money, if that increased their status within the family. So one of the jobs that women could do is that they could work in the local market. The, the regional market, which was, was, was held one day a week, was dominated by men. But we had a local market in the village. And so this woman would get up at 6 in the morning, and she'd be at the market till 6 at night. And she'd either be selling things that came from her family's land, or she would be buying wholesale and selling retail. And so this was one way that women were making money. Uh, Haja had a little shop where she, um, she knew how to sew and she had a sewing machine so she would uh, sew galabias uh, for women so she would make money that way. Some women had little stores that they ran outside of their house. Um, this uh, embroidery work that you see here, this is one of the things I, always, I, I learned how to do and I really like it. Some women would embroider the, the yokes uh, for others. Uh, and then this woman actually embroidered um, high fashion gowns from Cairo. This guy, you know, would come with these long gowns, and you know, you've seen these gowns that have like little seed pearls all over them. She'd do that work. Really miserable pay for that. And here you can see the different kinds of styles of the beading that they did. Notice the gold jewelry. And the thing was, is with all of this kind of, of work, this woman uh, made a pretty good living uh, selling fat. She would go to the butchers and she'd buy fat and then sell it door to door for women who wanted to render down shortening. She made a good living. One of the things that I discovered about all of these women who did this kind of work was it didn't really help them at all as far as increasing their status. You know, they were just, they were still, because they were working at home and oftentimes, uh, you know, working within the village close to home, they were just seen as housewives. I can remember one time uh, there was one of these uh, market women, and, you know, like I said, she works 12 hours a day. She made more money than her husband, who was a policeman. And I asked the, you know, he was there one time, and I asked the, her husband what he wanted his daughters to do. He said, oh, I want my daughters to be a housewife like their mother. I mean, so she's bringing in all of this money, and she's doing all this hard work, and it wasn't helping her at all. It wasn't increasing her decision-making ability, her autonomy. And by autonomy, that's the ability to, you know, control your own actions. And these women, to leave the house and go around the corner and see your mother, you had to have your husband's and your mother-in-law's permission. And if you forgot to ask him before he left for work that day, you could not leave the house. I mean, I'm talking about stepping outside the door. So no autonomy, you know, and no decision making. You know, these men would never dream of asking their wives about an important decision, even ones that affect their them, their children, like their education or their marriage or their children. This woman made a pretty good living. She would uh, 
Get up early in the morning, go to the next village over and buy these bakery products. She would make these salads. She would buy these eggs wholesale. And of course, eggs are protein stuff, so they're very expensive. Don't buy a dozen eggs here. You feed a whole family on two or three eggs each meal. You know, so you buy them by the piece. Now, this is one of my favorite families here. Um, this is the head of the family, and she had um, five sons, four of whom were married, and these were her four daughters-in-law here. And this is actually uh, my sister. Uh, she was the, the sister of uh, uh, the family that I was living with. So I became very, um, very close to this family. And the woman who's kind of got her head turned down, she's what I defined as an, an educated woman. She's been to high school. She graduated high school. And so I thought, okay, education, you know, maybe that's going to be the thing that increases women's status. So I looked at the status of these educated women, and if they were educated but they didn't work, again, no effect whatsoever. They were brought into the household. She was not all of these other women here, these other daughters-in-law, they can't even write their name. Uh, learning Arabic is really, to write Arabic, to be reading and writing Arabic is really, really difficult because it'd be like you learning to become literate in Russian. Spoken Arabic is really, really different from the modern standard written Arabic. And even basic words like bread are going to be different. So, uh, you, know, these, you know, even though they might have gone to first or second or third grade, you know, they, they're, they're basically illiterate. She graduated from high school. She's brought into this household treated exactly the same. So what I found was that education alone or uh, working and bringing in income alone didn't affect women's status at all. Now there were very few women in the village that were both educated and employed. And there was an amazing difference in the status of these women. This was a really unusual family. All three of these women uh, went to university, not just high school, but went to university. She was an Arabic teacher in a high school. She was running a grocery store. She had just graduated. She didn't have a job yet. But these, these women, like this woman here who was a secretary in a local factory, their status was completely different. They, their husbands consulted them about family decisions. They didn't have to ask anybody's permission to leave the household. And, you know, and, and, and in fact, instead of, you know, working for their mother-in-law, their mother-in-law was, you know, doing their housework and taking care of their kids because, you know, they were off at work. So what I found in my dissertation research was that, you know, education alone, you know, uh, making money alone didn't help. But just these very few women who were both educated and employed in the formal sector, it made a big difference. Now these are just some, some slides about you know, life in the village. This was our local um, pharmacy and uh, clinic. We had access to very good health care, and it was free. And the reason, or, or, and the drugs were highly subsidized. Drugs that I was spending you know, $25, $60 a month for, I was getting for $0.05, cents, $0.25 cents a month here. Um, and it was... Um, that at that time, you didn't have to pay college tuition. And your major was determined by your grades in like a, a, an exam, like a GRE. So if you got top grades, you could become a doctor or an engineer. So you got your doctor education, your education to become a physician for free. Imagine that. But to pay back the government for your free education, you had to volunteer in these rural uh, clinics. Uh, you know, for a couple of days a week. And so, you know, that's how we got, you know, all those great medical care <laughs> going out there. And this was our doctor, and I became very good friends with her. And it, one of the things you have to remember, I'm, I'm talking about rural people. Notice she's got short hair, short hair's not, you know, not down to here like the women's in the village. And she's got, you know, she, her apartment looks exactly like an American's apartment. She wears the same kinds of clothes. She drives her own car. So, What's going on in the city, you know, for middle class and upper class people is really different from what's going on in the countryside. Now, when I was there um, in the 90s, one of the things, I went back in the 90s, 
And one of the things that started was a, result, um, a rise of what we call Islamic fundamentalism and they call Islamism. And um, it's actually a movement that started in the city, in the colleges, especially at the College of Engineering at the University of Cairo. And by that time, it had started to filter down into the villages a little bit. And this was my sister, Leila. And uh, so you can see where she's got her um, hijab on. And the reason why she's wearing it is because uh, her husband uh, was working as a teacher in the, in the Islamic primary school that they had there. So, you know, but like a parochial school kind of a situation. So one of the things that uh, it was kind of interesting to me was that, you know, kind of the rise of this movement when women started first to, you know, wear these hijabs, the older women in the community were just scandalized. You know, because like she had, you know, she, these are her kids. And they'd say, look at her walking down the street without a black headscarf on. And she's got all these children. They just thought it was terrible, <laughs> you know. Now, this was me in my, uh, when I, in my uh, American University ID. One of the things that I used to do is I would wear a hijab when I would go into Cairo because I never had any trouble with sexual harassment when I was in um, the village, thank God, but there was a lot of problems with it when I was in Cairo. So if I had the hijab on and I wore sunglasses so nobody could see I had blue eyes, and my Arabic was good enough that everybody thought I was an Egyptian, so I never had any trouble with any of that. So uh, that's my ID, so I could, you know, get books out of the library and stuff like that. And these little girls here are all dressed up in these homemade hijabs because they just got to the equivalent of vacation Bible school, and they were all hepped up to learn how to, to pray. Now, in Islam, you usually you have to pray five times a day. And it's, once you start praying, if you, you can't just say, oh, I, you know, I'm not in the mood to pray today, <laughs> you know. It's a sin if you skip a prayer. So people don't usually start to pray until they're on 16. They're, you know, they're mature enough to take on that kind of a commitment. So these little girls are all, you know, they, they made these little homemade hijabs and they're, and they're badgering their mothers. Teach me how to pray, teach me how to pray. And there's nobody who can badger you like an Egyptian little girl. Oh my God, they're relentless, <laughs> you know. And they're really good at getting their way. And, oh, I can remember Tahani, the little girl in our household. She wanted something, and she spent the entire day going, following her mother around, going, oh, oh, it's ready to strangle this little girl. <laughs> her mother put up with it all day. So anyway, one of the things that it was really a surprise to me when uh, finally one of these little girls, you know, finally got her mother who'd been praying since she was 16 years old, um, you know, to, to go ahead and, and, and teach her how to pray. Her mother couldn't remember the words to the prayer because she had, um, you know, it, it was not in, in even modern standard Arabic. It was in um, ancient Arabic. And, you know, she was, it wasn't something that, you know, she ever went to school to study. 